Hey guys, welcome to Veteran Outdoorsman Channel. Who is the most influential gun designer of the 19th and 20th centuries? The late 19th and the 20th century. Many people will have varying opinions on this, but as a general rule, if you were to do a survey on this, and I think I will, it's going to be almost unanimous that John Moses Browning was the most influential and innovative gun designer of the late 19th and early 20th century. And I'm going to tell you why. It's good tea. Okay. Somebody's going to say, that looks awful light for tea. It's green tea with peach flavoring. Yeah. It might sound frou-frou, but it tastes good. John Moses Browning. From Ogden, Utah. Um, his father was a gunsmith. Uh, and moved to Utah during the Mormon Migration. John Moses Browning was was raised a Mormon, um, but most importantly, he was a gun designer, and he saw flaws in common firearms of the day. Now you've got to think, he grew up in a period of time where cartridge arms were starting to pick up and whatnot, but there were still a lot of muzzle loading firearms. Um, a lot of single shot cartridge firearms like the Remington Rolling Blocks, the Springfield Trapdoors, the uh, Sharps, Breech Loaders, but also you're seeing lever actions such as the Henry, the Winchester 1866. Don't if I if I mess that up, forgive me, the 1873. Um, and various Marlin lever actions as well, pump actions from companies such as Colt, Colt and Remington revolvers. But it was a very transitional time, and he saw some flaws, and he thought he could capitalize on that. So he designed a single shot 22 rifle and was selling them in him and his brother's gun shop in Utah and a company now well known for their firearms but was making a name for themselves at the time heard wind of that and sent some people out there to check it out and that company would be Winchester they went and checked out that design. They bought the patent for it. Um, Browning would go on, and I believe that's what became the low wall and later the high wall um, rifles, the single shot breech loaders. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure that's what that became. But anyway, it got started with a single shot 22 rifle. Hey. How many people got their start with single shot 22 rifles in the late part of the 19th and early part of the 20th century? That was the first rifle for many people. Um, whether it be a Remington rolling block, a Winchester falling block, more than likely a Springfield Stevens or Savage single shot, um, a Hamilton. And the list goes on. There were lots of what they called boys' rifles. Small, rolling or falling block, short, light, 22 rim fires. So, if you're going to get your start in firearms, that's a great place to do it. Game was 
Beginning, big game was beginning to be in fairly short supply much throughout the United States. A lot of conservation efforts hadn't been started yet. Game laws hadn't quite caught up with the lack of game. Um, so 22s were pretty popular for small game, plinking, etc. So it was a good place to start. Browning, with that rifle, began a long-lasting relationship with Winchester and designed a myriad of firearms for Winchester with some notable ones that we'll talk about. Um, the 1886, I believe, lever action, the 1892 lever action, the 1894 lever action. I believe also the 1895 was a Winchester design. The Winchester 1897 pump action shotgun. And I don't remember the, the year model nomenclature, but also the lever action shotgun by Winchester. It was in 1883, maybe? I'll have to go back and look that up. I, sh I should have brushed up on this, but um, I'm just going off the cuff. All of those firearms for Winchester, along with various uh, 22s, etc. That's a lot. Some of those very, very notable. The Winchester 92 replaced the 1873, which was known as the gun that won the West. But it was stronger, it was lighter, chambered in the same cartridges, and some new ones, such as 2520, 218B, known as a great lightweight, small game, two medium game at the time, rifle, um, chambered in cartridges such as 3220 or 32 Winchester Centerfire, 2520 or 25 Winchester Centerfire, um, 4440, 3840, later chambered in 357, 44 Magnum, 45 Colt. Also in replicas, chambered in 454 Casul. A very strong, lightweight. I had a Rossi 92, so, so a replica, um, a Rossi 92 in 357. It was as light as most 22s, but carried a lot more punch. It was a great gun for plinking. I deer hunted with it. Um, I shot I shot quite a bit of small game with it with 38 special loads. Um, accurate, reliable, a really strong action. Pistol cartridges where the toggle link action of the 1873 just didn't have the strength. Remember, that was a carryover from the Henry from 1861, I believe, and then, you know, a little bit of improvement in the 1866 Winchester, the first one to carry the Winchester name. But it was still a fairly weak gun, but it was days of black powder. Browning came along as smokeless is starting to come around, people are wanting more powerful cartridges, etc., etc., and he obliged and designed more powerful guns with more capable of handling more powerful cartridges. The Winchester 94 every deer hunter on earth has heard of. Originally chambered in, you can check out some videos I did, we'll do a brief history, originally chambered in 3240 and 3855, then in 1895 became chambered in 
30 Winchester Centerfire, which became the 3030, same cartridge, just different nomenclature. 2535, later on the 32 Winchester Special. And then later was chambered in cartridges like 375 Winchester, 307 Winchester, 356 Winchester, 444 Marlin in the big bores. Again, a strong, lightweight lever action. The 1886, I believe it was, but again, I, I may, may be wrong. Um, very similar to the 92 and the 94, was chambered in a myriad of what were generally single shot big bore black putter cartridges, such as the 4570, 4590, and, and many other cartridges along those lines. And now, chambered by custom um, gun makers and things like 500 Limbaugh and, and, and various large high thumping cartridges. Browning developed a auto-loading shotgun that he thought was going to change the world, and he was right. And he decided that he would go to Winchester and he would pitch this design, but he knew it was going to be popular. And instead of selling them the patent like he had, he, he had done on so many other firearms, he wanted a royalty deal. Smart business, right? Well, Winchester said no. And Browning says, that's fine. I'll go somewhere else. Ending a very long relationship with Winchester. He decides to go to Remington and pitch that design while he's waiting to talk to them. The man he wants to talk to dies. Finally, he finds himself in Belgium talking to Fabrique National. He begins a long relationship with them and they begin manufacturing the Browning Auto Probably the most revolutionary shotgun to ever hit the market. The first auto-loading shotgun, at least the first practical one. There may have been some prototypes and things out there, but the first practical auto-loading shotgun. Um, five shots as quick as you could pull the trigger. Long recoil action where the barrel actually retracts into the receiver when it fires very known for its reliability known for its durability it was used in world war one and world war two and he begins a relationship with fabric national and they begin manufacturing browning branded firearms you've heard the term belgian browning that means it was manufactured by Fabrique National in Belgium. But Browning didn't stop there. He did eventually get Remington to manufacture the firearm. He gave the, the rights to... He, he allowed Fabrique National to manufacture them, but didn't sell them the patent. So he could still get other people to manufacture that firearm. So that became the Remington model. 11 and then Savage under the Savage and possibly Stevens name also manufactured the gun under the Browning patents and later Franke and I believe it was the 48 um, began to manufacture a firearm under a Browning patent with the friction rings and everything, long recoil action, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Very, very popular. And there were other companies that made um, clones of it uh, of varying degrees of quality. The Belgian Brownings 
considered the creme de la creme. In my opinion, the later Japanese manufactured ones actually had better steel and uh, type tolerances and are very fine firearms, but guys weren't real fond of Japan in the 70s. Remember, that wasn't that long after they had marched our guys in the Bataan Death March. They weren't really a fan. You're only talking 30 years later. They weren't a fan of Japan. So it took a long time to warm up to that. But that doesn't matter. It's a browning design. And if you've been in the firearms world, the outdoor world, for any period of time, you've probably seen a Browning Auto 5, a Remington Model 11, or some other variant sitting in a closet or a gun safe or riding around, bouncing around in a gun rack. One of the finest auto loaders ever built and the one that got it all started. And companies scrambled, including Winchester, scrambled to come up with a competitor for the Browning Auto 5. Earlier I mentioned the 1897 Winchester pump action shotgun with a hammer. Oh, I've got a couple of them. That's what got it all the first practical, strong. There was an 1893 before that. This was an improvement on 1893, but the first practical and commercially successful pump action shotgun. If you like pump actions, you have Browning to thank. He's the one that got the ball rolling. He's the one that really got the ball rolling with strong, reliable lever actions. So let's look at some other things that Browning designed. Browning began a relationship with Remington eventually. And then he designed, the, again, you know, he had the, the Model 11. He designed the Model 8, which later became the 81 auto-loading rifle. Chambered in cartridges like 30 Remington, 25 Remington, 32 Remington. Later, cartridges like 300 Savage. Maybe 250 Savage. That one I'm not I'm not sure of, but I know 300 Savage, 35 Remington, etc. An auto-loading rifle. That was the original. That gun had the original nomenclature of the Woodmaster. We all know the 742 Woodmaster. Well, the Model 8, 80, 8 and 81 had the Woodmaster name on it as well. Something that you could go into the woods, bang, 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 on quick moving game. Could easily take a game the size of deer with the right cartridge, even elk, etc. And was known as a reliable gun. Um, known for being a gun that was used by law enforcement officers in um, when they shot Bonnie and Clyde. A number of officers had those guns chambered in 35 Remington, I believe. You can't say captured because they just ambushed them and killed them when they shot Bonnie and Clyde. Really popular rifle for both sportsmen and law enforcement at the time. Probably that day's equivalent of an AR-15 if you were talking auto loaders. And Remington designed, or sorry, Browning designed other firearms for Remington as well. And at that point, he began to venture out a little bit and whatnot. The U.S. government wanted an auto-loading pistol to replace the single-action and double-act, or, well, yeah, single-action, double-act. They wanted to replace the revolvers, namely the 1873 Peacemaker, which was getting pretty old. 
They wanted a 45 caliber. Um, they wanted equal power. That someone's going to say, well, the 45, they call it long cold, but it's just 45 cold, had more power than the 45 ACP. Yes, it did. But remember, the government used Colts and Springfield, or um, Smith and Wessons. The Smith and Wesson was chambered in 45 Schofield. Also, sometimes called the short colt, which is why you get the short colt and long colt nomenclature. But the 45 colt was always just the 45 colt, not the 45 long colt. And that shot a 230 grain bullet at around 800, 830 feet per second. Does that sound familiar? Enter the 45 ACP in the Browning design, 1911. Auto-loading handgun with a single sh single stack magazine that would handle six or seven rounds and sometimes eight, and you can get extended magazines of ten, and there were, I've even seen some up to like twenty. Great big long stick mags, and that one. The government contract and the U.S. government began having companies such as Colt, Ithaca, Remington, and others manufacture the 1911. Browning took it overseas and for foreign militaries, FN manufactured the 1911 for, um, for other militaries. Browning also... He started, I believe his son Val finished, the Browning High Power, which has been chambered in cartridges like 9mm Parabellum or 9mm Luger, 9x19. Um, I believe I've seen variants chambered in 40 Smith & Wesson, but don't quote me on that. 9x19 being the most common. The Browning High Power. He designed um, a Colt pocket pistol and various other firearms for Colt. Designed firearms for Remington. Designed firearms for Winchester. Designed firearms that became his own. He began working on what he thought would be a replacement for the Browning Auto 5 because he could see a time when people would, when governments would outlaw the auto loading shotgun. He saw the writing on the wall way back then and he began to design the Browning Superposed, a over under, um, an over-under double-barreled shotgun and would allow you to have two quick shots. The originals had two triggers like a side-by-side -side, and then later on they went to single triggers. He was working on that design when he died and his son Val finished that design and then that later became known as, um, though still manufactured as the superposed, then later a slightly modified, slightly cheaper version of that Manufactured by Moroku, became the Browning Satori. When Browning discovered that Moroku was manufacturing a very similar firearm to the Superpose at a lower price, and it was being imported by companies like Charles Daly, they had Moroku start manufacturing the Satori as a cheaper alternative to the Superpose. When you look at a at a today's Satori, the price tag of two thousand dollars, you think that's the cheaper gun? Look at a super post. <laughs> yes, it's still a cheaper gun. Less expensive. Not necessarily cheaper, but less expensive. John Browning's son, Val was a very accomplished gun designer in his own right. He kind of, he picked up the family business 
and ran with it after, um, before and after the death of John Moses Brown. And we might uh, touch on him in another video. But I would be willing to bet that there's not a firearm enthusiast in the world that hasn't at least handled, if not owned, a Browning designed firearm. I look through my own collection, I have a number of them from the Winchester 94. 1894. Mine's actually an 1894 before they dropped it to just the 94. The 1911. I've owned a number of those and I have one. The Winchester 1897. I have a couple of those. And the Browning Auto 5, which is probably the pride of my collection. And also family heirloom. John Moses Browning, from modest beginnings, began working in his father's gun shop. Um, stories of how he was working on a design, and he began scratching it out on a piece of scrap metal while he was eating dinner. He was ate up with firearm design. Um, very few people that, that have lived had the passion he did for designing firearms. And he designed them right up to the day he died. Legend has it that he died while working on firearms designs that his son Val would eventually finish. And I mean physically while he was doing it. He was a world traveler. He had an office in Belgium. Um, that Fabric National. He was a genius. An engineering genius. And a firearms genius. And if you asked him to make something that would do this, he did it. Now let's, we've talked about the civilian firearms, the sporting arms, a little bit into the military stuff. But multiple, multiple machine guns for military purposes were designed by none other than John Moses Brown. The Browning M2, Still in use today, chambered in 50 BMG. What does BMG stand for? Browning Machine Gun. If you ever served in the military and had your hind end saved by somebody behind a Browning M2, the Maudus, you have John Moses Browning to thank for it. And various other machine guns. A Browning design, the BAR, Browning Automatic Rifle. The forefather of the M60 and that ilk. A fully automatic. Um, rifle chambered in 30 out 6 and a formidable weapon um, made to lay down suppressive fire just the man was well beyond his years and various other browning designs um, used in civilian and military and law enforcement And many other guns derive from his designs, such as the Model 12, Winchester's later firearms designer took the Model 97 and 
took the features that he liked from it, turned it into a hammerless shotgun, became the Model 1912 or Model 12, which later led to the 1200 and 1300 and then the Super X pump that we have today. Slight, you know, modification, modification. Nothing close to the 97 anymore, but it just led on down the line. Remington had a 20 gauge bottom eject pump designed by Browning, and I don't remember the model nomenclature, but a company called Ithaca took that design and that patent and began to began manufacturing what is known as the Ithaca 37 a bottom eject pump action shotgun that has long been considered just as reliable as the model 12 which was which by many is the shotgun that all other pumps should be judged by um, is ambidextrous because of the bottom eject. And another company, later on, began using that same design and patent, slightly modified it, and started manufacturing the BPS, Browning Pump Shotgun. Hmm. Browning designed it, and then later, the Browning the company Began manufacturing it. Funny how those things work, isn't it? There's very few firearms today that don't share at least some of the designs that were originally innovated by Browning. John Moses Browning was a genius. His son Val also a very accomplished, very innovative gun designer. I can't imagine where the world of sporting firearms would be had John Moses Browning never been born or never had the insight and the drive to develop what he did. Google John Browning, look at his Wikipedia page, and look at the various firearms designs, and I only named a few. Not just the firearms designs, but the cartridges, the different aspects of firearms. I mean, the first practical and commercially successful Pump action shotgun. The first auto loading shotgun. I believe the first lever action shotgun. The Browning high wall and low wall, which companies still use to this day for custom fire high-end, custom, long-range, etc. firearms. The high walls have been chambered in cartridges like 30 on 6. Just beyond his years in innovation and knowledge. If he was alive today, he would still rival most current firearms designers. And remember, he's designing these guns and building prototypes in a small blacksmith slash machine shop in Utah in the 1800s and on into the 1900s, the early 1900s. Again, well beyond his years. The Ma Deuce, folks. 
a machine gun that is still feared by our enemies to this day. We have Browning to thank for it. The cartridge, the 50 BMG, chambered in rifles, even handguns now, which is insane. Yes, there is a 50 BMG handgun out there. I believe Kentucky Ballistics did a video on it. Used for long range shooting. Some people hunt with them. That seems crazy, but it's a free country. Do what you want. Just so many innovations. The 45 ACP, which is a very popular self defense cartridge. Just phenomenal. Um, Probably the only gun designer that I think touched as many hands as John Browning would probably be Mikhail Kalishnikov, and only because the firearm he designed, his, the AK-47, has been used by the majority of the Eastern world. Um, well, and, and the majority of the Western world, honestly. He developed an assault rifle, a true assault rifle, that has been used all over the globe um, by the good guys and the bad guys. One of the few firearms out there that during a war is typically used on both sides. <laughs> And he had other innovations and other designs that were very popular. But nothing. He had the, the quantity of Browning. As far as he touched his design touched as many people. But that's you know, a handful of designs, namely one. Well, Browning just had a myriad of designs that everyone is familiar with. See if there's anything important that I left out. I can't really think of it. But just an example of American entrepreneurship and wanting to make a go at something and a passion. And making it work, starting in a small little gun shop with his brother and building it into what the enterprise we have today. And, and the starting the relationship with Winchester and then Browning later, the company develops a relationship with Moroku and then over time, FN and Browning and Moroku and Winchester are all under the same head eventually, all bought by the same company. And that relationship was all started by John Browning. They've always been closely related companies, but John Browning got it all going. Somebody's going to say, well, John Browning never heard of Moroku. Maybe, maybe not. But his designs are what were manufactured by Moroku and eventually led it all together. Without a doubt, the most innovative and most influential firearms designer, if not in the world, at least of the late 19th and into the 20th century. Definitely of the 20th century. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. <sighs> Chances are, if you're a firearms enthusiast today, you've got a design made by Browning to thank for it. And I'm positive you fired at least one over the years. So guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. 
please take some time, like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, check us out on Facebook, um, Veteran Outdoorsman, and uh, I'll get back with you just as soon as I can with another video. Um, I've done some classic firearms, I've got a few more to talk about, um, I'm going to talk about just some, some firearms that are just well known a lot of a lot of people have had them over the years um you've probably got one sitting in a broom closet somewhere some things like that uh i'm going to spotlight some more uh, firearms designers innovators um so hope you enjoy that and we're going to see you in the next video thank you so much for watching